Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line on a, let's see, what is today? Is today Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? 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 Yeah. I forget what day it is, week it is. When you come back from uh, overseas, you, you have to be given at least two weeks to just sort of wander around like a zombie. <laughs> uh, it uh, feels much better that way. But uh, anyways, uh, I am joined in studio today by the ninja himself, Jeff, Dur- Jeff Durbin. Hey! I, I can say your name. I wore a... Uh, where was I? Oh, I, Sunday night. I wore a hat that I purchased in South Africa, um, and it says Durban on it. Mm-hmm. But uh, first thing Jeff says when he sees me is, you misspelled he it. He spelled it wrong. <laughs> 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 I, and somehow, I, I don't know, I had not thought about that uh, prior to... <laughs> really? To, to, wearing it around everywhere? You don't yeah, never thought about it? <laughs> cause, uh, cause He's just I, trying to represent... I've actually been to Durban, yeah. so I actually... Yeah. It's it's a city of contrasts, a yeah. city, and one of the major uh, suburbs is Phoenix. Yeah, There's a place called Phoenix. So I was yeah. preaching in Phoenix. Uh, it was it was rather interesting. That's so, amazing. Yeah, yeah, but it's a very very different Phoenix than uh, than what we have here. But good to have you along. Uh, we were just sitting around at. Um, I think it's about the only restaurant other than that one Italian place that you and I have ever actually. Uh, it's your favorite place. I, I'm I, fine I, with it. I think I it's really delicious. Do. I think it's yeah. good. it's good. It's not yeah. overly expensive. It's called Cafe Rio. Yep. I think you're the one. You that... need to start actually getting sponsorship from Cafe Rio but for I, the I program. But I have their app. Did you see? I, I know. I know. So you were very I'm... focused in getting your receipt in that app so you can get your free stuff. <laughs> free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we were sitting around because we have a debate coming up. Uh, we're not exactly sure where it's going to be yet. Uh, we thought we did, but we're working on it. Um, we have a debate coming up in Salt Lake City. And so, yes, it is, a, it is, it is wise to um, take the time to consider how you're going to handle said debates and uh, i i uh, yesterday morning uh, out in the dark in the desert was listening to one of the two atheists we're going to be debating wherever that ends up being located at and uh October third is the schedule. It is date. October third. Yeah, uh, we thought we knew where it was going to be at, but there's some we we can't confirm that right now. Hopefully, we'll very quickly. Um, but uh, I was listening to one of the two uh, atheists, and uh, it's going to be. I can guarantee you one thing: it will not be a boring debate. Yeah, no, it will not be a boring debate. It will be. We can uh, say the name. Can I say the name? Can we say the names of them? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Dan Ellis, who is the president of uh, a- a- Atheist, you, you, Utah Atheist. Utah, Utah Atheist. Yes, yes, yes. And then uh, Greg, Dr. Greg Clark. Right. Uh, so it's uh, two on two, and uh, it's, it's you and I versus two atheists, and the debate is uh, the triune God lives. Right. And does yes. uh, Dr. Clark is a, is a very intelligent man, but he also identifies himself as a, what was the term that they were using? Radical atheist? Wow. Um, very um, straightforward. He has no respect uh, for religious systems whatsoever. He considers them to be absurd. Uh, but he also uh, has a very fascinating area of work that he also described in this video that I, I really enjoyed listening to that. And the funny thing was, he was a completely different person. When discussing that, uh, right, than right. when he was. Uh, that was my phone. Sorry, I was I just. I could yeah. tell. It, was, yeah. it sounded like me though. Yeah, it was you. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's a little bit weird. Um, anyways, so it's going to be uh, a, a fascinating encounter. We're going to be up there, of course, for the general conference of the LDS Church, first weekend in April, first weekend in October. Uh, this will be the first conference I've been at since. I don't know. Two, Thousand three or four? I, I has it really been that long? I really think it has been. Um, the King James only guy who started showing up around then, and one of the funny thing was things is you were there in April. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the, the phones are open. If you'd like to call and talk to Jeff and I, it's 877-753-3341, 877-753-3341. You were up there in April, and you said that there were. Um, they wouldn't be called protesters, but there were there were people out there uh, who were identifying as homosexual Mormons. Yes, it did they have signs? Fascinating. Yes, yeah, okay. that was actually uh, transgender oh, okay. uh, Latter Day Saints uh, out there. So men dressed like women, oh, and okay. um, and uh, some you know some profess- now if they were wearing the female temple garments, that would be cause some really, problems. Really, that would have been interesting. Really, yeah. Hadn't thought about that one, had yeah. you? No, you hadn't. Rich, uh, we can hear Rich through the wall. Uh, he's 
days had not given that one a, a second thought. Um, but what we what I found fascinating is how are they being received? Well, that was the thing that was shocking to me because when I walked up, I didn't know how this was going to go down mm-hmm. because they have at Temple Square, they have this little square for us to stand in around right. the side. So right. like we're out of the way and everything else. And so I didn't know how it was going to go because I walk up to where we're allowed to stand to hand stuff out and talk. And I see him standing over there and I see him with their signs. I know what they're there for. It's LGBT stuff. And you can just tell. So I was actually very curious how is this going to go down. And it was, they were very, very well received the entire time. Mm. Uh, people were coming up, going out of their way to stop and say, oh my goodness, I love you. And you know, I'm so, you know, I'm so, I'm so proud of your fight and your struggle and I'm with you and I can't wait till you guys are received and you know all those things they were praised they were praised there were some like real orthodox Latter-day Saints that were in conversation with me very ple- pleasant conversations that would I would ask them like how, how, do, you, how do you feel about this like you know and they, they would just oh no I, I'm, I'm yeah, not good yeah, yeah. but they kept quiet about it yeah, but yeah. the ones who were who were vocal were be, yeah, they were definitely well received well we were there uh, the very first year that anyone like that showed up at conference. I don't remember which year it was. It was in the late 1990s. There weren't that many of them. And of course, back then, there weren't any free speech zones uh, or anything else. You had the run, uh, well, that was before the, uh, th- that other building opened up. Mm-hmm. So you had the run of all of Temple Square, uh, all the way around it. So they were at the South, uh, the South Gate, and there, it was frigid. Mm-hmm. There was, there was, they were just well, shunned. It, it, how long essence. ago was that? When did that start? When they started showing up? That was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. 20 years. 20 years. Is all years. it took. Yeah, 20, 20, 20, 20 years. years. Well, you look at society, same thing there. Yeah, right, same right. We were there. talking about that over lunch. Just yeah. the, the d- dramatic changes that we wouldn't if you even thought were possible, even within professing Christianity. Good, solid communions and things like that. Well, and Mormonism, though, leaves me completely befuddled because you have an absolutely gendered God mm-hmm. in Mormonism. God is a male. Mm-hmm. The priesthood is a male possession. Um, the power of God is the power of procreation and the priesthood. Mm-hmm. That's... you. you you want the patriarchy? Summer's looking for the patriarchy. We found it. It's in Salt Lake City. It's, it's been there all along. That's right. Okay? That's right. It's yeah. Just, there's no reason to go yeah. looking anywhere else uh, yeah. than there. And so I, the I, I don't know how Mormonism, how is it collapsing so quickly on this subject? Because mm-hmm. it is. I mean, you look at what's going on in Utah, and they're just going right along with the cultural flow. It's like there's there's just nothing there. And there are Mormons. You talk to some of them, but they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. Right. I've met with Mormons. Uh, I remember meeting with this guy uh, th- that I talked with a number of times. And there are a lot of Mormons sitting there going, what happened to my church? Mm-hmm. And the sad thing is they're not so much thinking that they were wrong before and hence be looking for something else. It's just they're they're left with nothing to nothing to hold on to yeah it's so like yeah like we were talking about before what's the next stage for mormonism proper yeah uh, also, also as, at least slc like the main you know, what's it going to look like is there going to be a figure that arises and sort of says hey let's get back to our roots and this is apostasy and let's get back to what is really joseph's revelation and mm-hmm. on and on uh, what will mormonism look like in 25 years very very good question i don't know there, it is rife for a charismatic leader. There's no question mm-hmm. about that. Someone like that, especially with social media mm-hmm. and just a little bit of backing, could have a huge following. I'm mm-hmm. not suggesting this to anyone. I'm not, yeah. uh, any yeah. false prophets yeah. Uh, unemployed right yeah, now? Yeah, because we got some work for Call you. Call in now. It's in house LC. <laughs> no, actually, I was uh, years ago, uh, I was teaching classes for concerned Christians when that was still around oh, wow. uh, in Mesa. That was a long yes. time ago. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I remember I was there, and uh, Jim, Jim Robertson was in there uh, in his office, and some guy kind of wandered off the street kind of poking around, looking around. And it's a real small little, you know, place. And so it's kind of, you know, you know when someone walks in and is poking around. And right. so I'm like, you know, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, you know, I saw the sign. And he, he thought we were associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm. So um, he says, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm wondering uh, if you guys can help get me connected. I was like, well, what, connected to who, to what? He said, well, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in, in real, real 
Mormonism, uh, historic Mormonism. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And uh, he, I'm just and like, how I'm many wise do you want? And that? that's <laughs> what he was there for. He <laughs> was asking me if I knew of an, if this was like a, a legitimate connecting point to get to the real Mormons. Mm-hmm. He said, because I'm really a big believer in the polygamy. Mm-hmm. And I think where the church has gone today, it's gone way off the rails. And I said, well, you know, have a seat. I want to talk to you about something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. you're kind of in the wrong place, yeah. but I'm glad you're here. But that's what he was looking for was real Mormonism. Yeah. 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 I, re- I remember, um, I, I, I can see the guy's face. I don't remember what his name was, but. What? And what, what story was I about to tell? Well, okay, no, I wasn't talking about polygamy. Sorry. Um, but but let's, g- let's keep that one on backup, Rich. <laughs> yeah, 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 I want to yeah. hear that story yeah. now. No, well, uh, according to other people, we met a lot of of polygamists uh, in, in Salt Lake City, actually. They may not have identified themselves as such at that particular point in time, but we, but we did. Uh, anyway, uh, we were talking to a Mormon at the South Gate, and he pointed up at the spire of the of the temple. Were you there for this one? And uh, he pointed up the spire of the temple, and he said, I guarantee you that within, I think he said, within 25 years, there will be a cross on the top of that steeple. Hmm. And I found that really, really interesting, um, That he, because he already saw the mainstreaming that was going on, uh, which Gordon Hinckley started, really. And 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 pushed, but, anyways, long story short, we got people on hold. Uh, do we? We're, oh, we do. We've people got, on deck. Uh, we've got we've got uh, four uh, four lines uh, lined up. Um, we're going to be up there, so we uh, ask for people's uh, prayers for the uh, the debate. Uh, we're doing a dialogue uh, the next night, and then we have the outreach on uh, on Saturday, and then I'm preaching um, Sunday school and Sunday morning service at uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Magna, uh, Jason Wallace's uh, church up there in yeah. Salt Lake. So. so, so Thursday debate, Friday discussion with a Mormon, but Friday and Saturday, apology, a church will be out there um, doing evangelism at Temple Square. So y'all could be going out Friday night just for the people Friday and yeah Friday and Saturday that's the plan yeah okay cool all right so with that I suppose I should put this in here so you're so used to wearing headphones you just automatically throw them on yeah uh, you know it's not like it hurts my hair I was wondering when you're gonna put yours in if you're gonna answer phones by intuition it's it's not like (laughs) he's been doing this for so long he doesn't even need the headphones he knows what you're he knows what you're gonna ask guys (laughs) all he needs to do is see your number (laughs) and notice that he's been doing this so long yeah Yes, uh, you you remember my younger days. Uh, I remember your younger days. Yeah, that's right. Be a better way of putting it. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the phones. You've got an opportunity to talk to me, and I didn't even. You just you've just been here so many times. I didn't even bother to introduce you as as well. I called you the ninja. Right. Yeah. I mean, but you know, people know. I think people know. People know. I if, think people if, know. Yeah, because either, it's either Alpha and Omega connects them to Apology or Apology to Alpha and Omega. Uh, you and I both Somehow around the became, world. It became Every wound together. Every place we go. I think if we went to the South Pole, there'd be somebody saying, I learned about you from watching Jeff Durbin's mm-hmm. videos or the yeah. other way around. It's, yeah, it's I, just... I do actually take heat, too, for the things that you say and Rich says. Like, <laughs> if, Rich, if Rich says something, I'm like, people are like, well, why did he say that? I'm like, well, <laughs> why don't you go ask, go ask Rich? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Right. Hey, you, and, you, and, and you saw when you walked in today. Yeah. What am I doing? You're on the phone getting yelled at. I'm, I'm answering. <laughs> I'm the just phones. joking. I'm answering You're answering the phones. phones I tell yeah. people. Yeah. I tell people that I answer the phones and I do. Yeah. So you call the number, not just during the show, but you right. call the number. I answer the. And phone. you can talk to Rich. Yeah. The Rich Pierce. Yeah. You will talk to him. That's right. Okay. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Rich, which which of these is this? Because I could I couldn't hear you. Which which no which which of the little thingies over here do I have to turn? Well, I can. I, I'll convey to you what Rich is saying. No, 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 no. That means I <laughs> That'll be fun. Hear me now. Yeah. So, he me says now? Um, he's buying dinner for the rest which, of the week every day. Uh, I'm turning you up over here. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Well, we'll we'll find out here when we try to talk to. Because uh... don't touch it, you'll break it. This is Tanner in Colorado. Hi, Tanner. Hi, Doctor White. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good, good. Um, just a quick background. Uh, you talk about you know learning from each other and and. Um, and you know getting cross contamination of audiences i was actually saved 11 to 12 years ago and started listening to your podcast 
and um, and now I'm a pastor today. So wow. I'm a pastor of First Baptist Church of Leadville, and, and I um, think a lot of that is due to your ministry, so both of your guys' ministry has really impacted me. Appreciate Leadville? It. So I... Uh, yeah, Leadville, Colorado. I, uh, I rode through through downtown um, just a few weeks ago during what's called the Copper Triangle. You're familiar with it? I, I'm not familiar with the Copper Triangle itself, but I remember following your uh, podcast when you were when you were up here in Colorado, and I was wondering if you'd come through here. So that's that's cool to hear. Yep, yep. Gonna try to do that again next year. So uh, uh, if you're if you're driving around on a Saturday morning, please uh, don't run into any of all those cyclists riding through riding through town. I know it's a pain, but uh, it's it's fun. So, anyways, well, good. No, that's that's good. great it's... to hear, Tanner. What can we do for you? So I have a couple of related questions. Hopefully, they go together. Um, my first, my primary question has to do with the Holiness Code in general. I started listening to. I know you have a backlog of many sermons you did on the topic of the Holiness Code, and my training was such that if we could discover the reason for the law, and we could discern that that reason no longer applies today, then we had no need to follow that law. So, for example, um, sexual relations during a menstrual period, I was taught that that had to do with blood, blood has to do with Christ's sacrifice, Christ fulfilled that, and so while Hygienically, you may want to observe that law. We are under no moral obligation to observe that law today. And I was listening to your series on the Holiness Code, and you made a comment that caused me to rethink this, and you said that we need to be very careful about saying we only need to follow laws when we can discern their meaning or their purposes. Right. And so I was hoping you would maybe speak to that a little bit and, and maybe help me to come to a better understanding on that. Yeah, nothing like starting off with the easy stuff, right? That's right, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, obviously, um, we live in a day when uh, especially uh, the the law, as found in the, the Mosaic Code, the Holiness Code, now the Holiness Code is a specific section of that law, and I went outside of just Leviticus 18, 19, and 20 to a number of texts in Deuteronomy and other places in that 35 sermon series, which I think is what you're referring to there that you've listened to. Um, but, but I started with a presupposition um, that what we need to do with the law is to recognize the concept of its abiding validity and to understand that its fulfillment in Christ is in regards to the penalty for the breaking of that law, but that law continues to reveal to us what has always been pleasing to our Creator. And the challenge for us is to take certain laws that had to do with Israel's existence in the land, and of course we're talking 3,000 years ago, etc., etc., and try to understand None of us are are putting, almost none of us are yoking oxen today, for example. Um, right. And so the idea that most people have is anything about that becomes irrelevant. It better not be, because you go to the New Testament, and Paul starts talking about ministers in the New Testament, and what does he do? He pulls that very law up as being relevant to the continued support of ministers of the gospel. So... If you want to have an apostolic example, um, then you need to follow the apostles' example. And they didn't treat the law the way... And I was taught the same thing, basically, Tanner. I was, that's pretty much the, you know, that's a very common perspective amongst evangelicals in regards to looking at God's law. I just came to the conclusion from my own studies of how the New Testament utilizes the Old Testament law that that's not what the apostles did, and I needed to follow the apostolic example, even if that makes me somewhat unpopular with, uh, with certain elements of people. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, all through that series, what I'm trying to do is, is say this is the, the, the reason to tackle even some of the really tough texts um, that I tackled uh, in, in the course of that, which most people, look, let's just be honest, they just won't touch them anymore. There's no reason to, there's no purpose to. Some people want to unhitch um, the Old Testament completely from the New Testament. I'm looking over at Jeff, he has some experience with that particular subject. Um, 
But even amongst people who recognize that the Andy Stanley perspective is too radical, there is still a, what I would call, functional antinomianism um, that fundamentally sees um, the, the law as done away with rather than fulfilled. And there's, there's obviously something very different between fulfillment in Christ uh, which can allow you to look at the law as a continued abiding uh, indicator of what's pleasing to God and, and so on and so forth, and the idea that most people have, and that is, well, once Christ comes, then that part of the Old Testament, you really don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. You might want to read it once so you can say you've read through your Bible all the way, but it, it doesn't have uh, really that kind of, uh, of, of meaningful application. The problem is that once we get into a lot of the cultural issues that we're facing today, um, we are left without much of anything if we can't look back to what the what Moses and the prophets uh, did say and laid a laid a foundation for. Um, Jeff, you you spoke with uh, Andy Stanley. You you dealt mm-hmm. with people that were disconnecting that stuff. Um, you want to you want to add something there? Yeah, I, mean, I can't say much better than that. I think that's perfect, and I do highly recommend uh, those sermons uh, or those lectures through the Holiness Code. Um, and, and the issue with like Stanley, this came up, and it's it's really I think powerful. I think Briley did a good job at uh, putting that together in terms of when I was on Unbelievable talking with Andy Stanley about unhitching the Old Testament. He started off where he needed to start, and that was the issue of uh, foundations and authority, um, ultimate authority. Is it human reason? Uh, where, where, where's, the, where's the stopping point? Where do I actually say, okay, here and not anything beyond that? This is the, this is the yes and amen and ultimate. And so that at, at first was about apologetic methodology. Right. And that's, it's interesting though, because it's not just about apologetic methodology. This really is a connecting point to sola scriptura, mm-hmm. ultimately. And um, where is the ultimate authority? Is it in the church? Is it, is it, uh, is it in, um, uh, where is it a human reason? What's, what's the stopping point? So we did that with Stanley, and then it led into the discussion of unhitching the Old Testament, and it got right down to the issue of authority again. And it, I, it, we did talk about that, the fact that in the New Testament documents you have the, um, the apostles referring back to not just animal husbandry laws, but judicial law mm-hmm. in terms of a case law example, they'll even appeal. I mean, it's, it's done numerous times in the New Testament, the issue of two to three witnesses. Mm-hmm. Well, that has to do with the judiciary. That has to do with like receiving accusations and punishing somebody. You mm-hmm. can't do it on the basis of one witness, but multiple witnesses, two to three. And it's not just writing to people inside the nation of Israel at this time either. No. It's writing to Gentile churches, so on and so forth. That's right. So Jesus appeals to this throughout his ministry, right. two to three witnesses. He appeals to it in the issue of church discipline. He, uh, it's appealed to throughout the New Testament documents by the Apostle Paul. Uh, you even have, I, I brought this up because I thought it was interesting in terms of um, the, the principle that God lays down. Because no one's saying you take the law of God and slap it on society. Like we're saying, how do you actually approach the law of God in a way that actually is consistent with the revelation of God, Old and New Testament? But the Apostle Paul, even while he's at trial and he's receiving accusations, he, something interesting, I, I've missed it for a long time, but he says something interesting there too mm. in terms of what his grounding is even for penalties in his own mind as an apostle, he says when he's being accused, if I've done anything worthy of death, I don't object to dying. Like if there's something, so there is something that's worthy, according to his own mind as an apostle, there's something that's worthy of the death penalty in the judiciary. And he says, if I've done anything worthy of death, I don't object to dying. Like if I, if I, if it's owed to me, I'll take it. That's post-cross, post-resurrection, post-ascension. So you have um, judicial law in terms of accusations, you've got animal husbandry laws, and you even have the death penalty reference in terms of principle. Well, where's all that coming from? It's not just sort of suspended in midair. It's not the opinion of the apostles. They're grounding it somewhere. And so I think that's important. But if somebody says to me, like, well, what about all this stuff with the holiness code and, like, the different uh, fibers and you know, right. you've got animals? I'm like, well, that's th- the reason why I say I don't I, I, I can eat bacon today <laughs> is because. Of ex- well, Jesus said so. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. the most important. Well, thing. exactly, because it's actually referenced <laughs> because we're told, yes, it's, it's not unclean. And then you also have the explicit statements in Scripture from, apost- from an apostle that says, this this dividing wall, this holiness code, these, I call them training wheels um, in terms of sanctification and holiness for the people of Israel, it's told to us this is now passed away. It served its purpose. It was doing something, and now in Christ it's gone and done. Now Jew and Gentile are together in one body. These things aren't necessary anymore because there's a new covenant. 
and the people of God together in one body. That's why this is shaved off. Not that it was irrelevant or meaningless. Right. It meant something. And I like that terminology, training wheels. And, and the, the, the real area where there is still a lot of uh, argumentation and dispute is to understand exactly where those dividing lines are mm-hmm. in regards to what, what specifically marked the people of Israel um, and what didn't. Right. So, so if we have the new covenant, then what is, where, is, where is that at? And the tendency has been to get rid of a lot of stuff. And in the process, right. though, uh, for example, in, in Leviticus 19, you know, love your neighbor as yourself is smack dab in the middle of all that other stuff. That's right. And so we, I just don't see that there has, there has always been a, a lot of real careful analysis and consideration of what, what could be the abiding um, moral principles that are found in things that are frequently just dismissed as being, that was just the juice, that was just, mm-hmm. that was just then. Um, and so uh, careful people in this area have admitted there's still a lot of work to be done. Sure. The problem is there's not all that ma- many people doing work in the area because of the presupposition that ah, it's, it's all done away. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, that's this Old Testament. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, I just want to say this, this to that um, issue is we, we better be glad that the law of God even down to some of these case law examples of like property um, boundary markers, mm-hmm. um, parapets around the roofs of houses, right, right. Um, in terms of two to three witnesses, we better be so glad that that wasn't glanced over or neglected right. a couple hundred years ago because the basis of the Fourth and Fifth Amendment is God's judicial law. Right. I mean, it was referenced explicitly by those Presbyterians and Baptists and Anglicans in America, when they were talking about building communities and justice, they were always referencing God's judicial standards in terms of, well, here's a general equity. That's how God feels about that. That's how we should feel about it. And like I said, I think, you know, when we talk about today and the benefits that we have today that are hanging on by a thread in terms of justice in our society, when you look at like the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, that's built upon a Christian worldview. That's not secular humanism that gives you the the issue of like warrantless searches and seizures, you know, being illegal. I mean, that comes from a particular point in history. Christians had been abused in history, and when they start pointing to the law of God and God's standards of justice, they bring reformation and transformation in their communities and societies. So they look at God's law and they say, We've got these people just coming into our houses and just taking us away without warrants, and we're, we're having to actually self-incriminate in court, and that's, that doesn't fit what God says. His law actually says that you've got to have witnesses before I can have a charge brought against me, so you can't come ransacking my house and taking my stuff and go poking around for, to find you know, mm-hmm. that I'm guilty. God says you can't do that. You've got to have evidence and witness. So there, there you have in the American system the blessings of God's judicial law today. And that's the issue again of like, I don't have to self-incriminate. Where's that come from? Atheism? No, that comes from a Christian worldview. You've got to have witnesses and independent lines of evidence to accuse me for me to actually be punished for anything, and you can't come poking around in my house looking for looking for a failure on my part or guilt on my part. You've got to have evidence before you can do such right. a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there, uh, Tanner. Um, there's there. Uh, there's a spectrum of material out there that is very, very, very wide. Very, very, very wide. And I'm not saying right. that everybody who uh, will have a high view of God's law is necessarily balanced in all of their applications and all their understandings. There has to be a lot of discernment on your part. Um, but don't be afraid to read widely, uh, is, is what I'm saying, and look for consistency. I think that's, that's the best way to go. Very good. That's, that's very helpful. Do you mind if I, I tag on a, a follow-up that's loosely related? That's, that's what related? Loosely. loosely related. Uh, uh, well, there are three other people online, but make it quick. Okay, I I was um, reading through Mark chapter two twenty three to twenty eight. That's where um, Jesus violates the Sabbath, and he essentially appeals to David, and David utilizing, um, you know, e- eating the bread when he he wasn't allowed, and him and his, um, you know, his mighty men. My, my my question is is the way I've heard that described is something I'll call law priority or graded absolutism, where these are still absolute commandments of God, 
These are still absolute commands that he gives us, but they are graded within and amongst themselves. So we can still hold to an absolute moral standard while by the same token recognizing that some absolute moral standards hold higher authority than others. But part of the reason I'm bringing both of these questions up is I'm introducing to our Bible study tonight the topic of homosexuality. We've been talking through Christian ethics, and I, I want to discuss all this. You know, they dismiss Leviticus 18 to 20. Pretty much they throw it all out the window because of a few verses. And I just want to develop a consistent hermeneutic mm-hmm. on this topic so that I can hold to a good biblical standard um, that is able to kind of, I, I guess, um, answer the skeptics and the critics while also maintaining the integrity of the Word. So that's, that's I guess, my question is on yeah. that law priority, graded absolutism. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that, that, that particular subject I dealt with a great deal uh, in in that sermon series because that was that was the whole point. I mean, I think it was the very first time in the history of any Reformed Baptist Church, especially PRBC, um, that uh, we had played over the sound system a audio from a TV show uh, because I played the um, uh, president going after the. Uh, what was her name? Oh, in that TV series. The TV series. Yeah, The West Wing. Yeah, West Wing. I, I, I played the West Wing clip. And we actually <laughs> played that over the speakers. Oh, yeah? Now that, uh, trust me, that was an absolutely unique event yeah. in the context of that church. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, it was specifically why I started at that point was to say this is this is the kind of abuse and misuse of this material that is now rampant in our society we need as we need to know how to respond to yes yeah. and so that was really what I was attempting to do there and as far as you know the the only thing I would say there clearly are you know moral and ethical questions where you're dealing with the issue of what seem to be in our experience competing commandments um, and and how we prioritize things, all of that is quite true. The one thing I'd say about Mark chapter 2, though, um, is you have to keep in mind who's speaking there. Verse, verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, is central to understanding what Jesus is claiming, who he's claiming to be, and his interpretive power at that particular point in time, uh, which the the Jews would be rejecting. So this is one of the very first times when Jesus is really making that kind of incredibly elevated claim for himself. And so that has to be kept into, you know, brought into consideration as well as to who it is that was picking the grain and who he is, and he's Lord of the Sabbath, and, and, uh, you know, that, that's going to end up paralleling John chapter 5, when he says, my father's working, and I'm, my father's working until now, and I am working. And they pick up stones to stone him. Why? Because they understand that he's making a claim to deity at that, at that particular point right. in time. So that's important in that as well. But yeah, I, I think, obviously, the command to save life, not to kill, um, is, 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 in a, is, in a sense, a higher commandment than to not wear uh, mixed fibers. Um, right. One is one is marking the people of God off from people around them. The other is an abiding commandment that everyone is held accountable to at, at all times. Uh, so that's that's one of those 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 issues. But hey, everybody else on the phone is going to get starting get starting to look up every tanner in Colorado and uh, putting out <laughs> putting out a, a hit hit on you. So uh, we got to move on. Thanks, oh, Tanner. Boy. Thank you so much. You've both been immensely helpful. Take care. God bless. All right, thank Thanks, you, brother. God bless. <laughs> yeah, Leadville. That's a, there's a famous hundred mile uh, mountain bike race in Leadville. Really? And um, and then it's it's on it's on it was on the way back toward um, Vale. Uh, that's a tough ride. That's a that's high altitude. That's a tough ride. Hundred miles. Uh, it was only, it was only uh, it was seventy eight. But you're at altitude, so it's it's challenging. All right, let's uh, go down to Texas and talk to. Is it Devonta? Devonte, brother. Devonte. All right. How are y'all today? We're doing good. You know, I had I was I felt a bit guilty about having two questions, and then I heard Turner, I heard Tanner unload all of that, and all guilt <laughs> left. All guilt left at that moment. Okay. Uh, so be- before I ask my two questions, I'm not about to do a soapbox thing. I just want to say, Brother Jeff, thank you for the sermon you had on God's law. When I tell you that was like a glacier of godly water on my tongue, 
It was amazing. Oh, I just wow. wanted to say that. Oh, praise God. Thank you very much. Thank you for the blessing. Thank so, you. Yes. I have two questions. One of them is related to te- uh, church history. The other is textual criticism. Um, I was watching your debate, Dr. White, with Jerry Maddox on uh, Sola Scriptura. I actually went and bought the, the uh, Webster and King book because of that. Me and the brother are about to read it. Good. But um, I was watching the debate. I was watching the debate, and there's a part where you say that, talking about it's first or second Thessalonians that Catholics always bring up about whole fast the traditions. Yep. And you said that Tertullian actually referenced that. I, I believe you said Tertullian, and he said there was Gnostics in his day that claimed to have this private oral revelation that was unique to them. Where does Tertullian say that? Huh. Uh, well, <clears throat> you'd have to uh, you'd have to send a, a note in for me to. I mean, I don't keep that kind of uh, reference on the top of my head, and that oh, debate darn, was in sure that debate was in <laughs> 1996. Um, so that was 22 years ago. Um, so yeah, no, I uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but my my recollection though um, was that. I thought that had to do with 2 Timothy 2 and um, Paul passing on to trusted people uh, what, um, what he was teaching to Timothy. Uh, I mean, that's my recollection, but um, I probably have those debate notes buried somewhere, but I'd have to, I'd have to look it up to have a specific reference to, to what Tertullian oh, okay. said. But I think if you looked up um, if you have a index for Tertullian's writings in the Schaff edition, if you look up either Second Thessalonians two fifteen or I think it's Second uh, Timothy uh, two two, yeah, either one of those two references is probably going to pull it up because that it was one of those two texts. Okay, okay, thank you. It's mm-hmm. okay. It was twenty plus years ago. You ate. It was a while back. Um, how, how how old are you, Devante? I am twenty five. Okay. Do you, how uh, do, and do you remember things real clearly from twenty uh, two years ago? <laughs> not 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 unless my mother's there. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time I remember them. <laughs> okay. Yes. Second question. Uh, okay. Um, you know, I I have to apologize to Rich. Because I said I, was, I wanted to ask about textual criticism, and now that we're talking, I have to ask you something else. Oh, uh, well, see, I, I like textual criticism, so, you know. That's... I do, too. I, I love it, but I can look up an article by Dr. Mike Kruger or something. Um, I recently came up, I won't say, I recently started to actually see the biblical support for presuppositional apologetics mm-hmm. and, like, watching the How to Answer the Fool with uh, Titan Brudenkate. And I'm just. I'm just getting a little bit of background so you can understand. Before, I was, like, heavy ed- evidentialist. Like, I think evidentialism is great if people weren't born dead in sin <laughs> and they didn't hate God, then that would be the way to go. Yeah. What are, what are yeah. some of the... But, but if they weren't born and dead in sin, you wouldn't be needing apologetics anyway. Yeah. So that's really yeah, right. where the... Yeah, you know. Right. What are? Have you ever actually heard any good arguments against presuppositionalism? Because it all seems to boil down to... People think that other people are genuinely seeking God and all they need is evidence. But the Bible doesn't say that. So like I don't know how you would how somebody would biblically support evidentialism. Like have you have you ever yeah. heard anybody make a case for that? Oh well, yeah. I mean, um but but it all boils down to one of two things. Um and feel free to add to this, uh, Jeff. But it, it it all boils down in my experience to either a rather gross misrepresentation of what presuppositionalism is actually saying. And so what you'll, what you'll very often get are, are people saying, well, you're, you're saying that you should never mention evidences, you're saying that you should just simply argue in a, in a tight, irrational circle, all the rest of the stuff. I, I rarely, even amongst solid people, I rarely hear an accurate representation of what the application of presuppositional apologetics would look like. Uh, hopefully Jeff and I will provide an example of that in a couple of weeks in, uh, in Utah, but um, we've done that in past debates uh, as well, and people can take a look at that. Or 
what it ends up boiling down to um, is a fundamental difference on the subject of anthropology. That is, what is man? What is man's status? Um, is man dead in sin? Is man suppressing the knowledge of God? What does man do when truth is presented to him? And that ends up normally coming from either a deficient theology on the part of somebody else, or very, very often it is a matter of having philosophical presuppositions that people are committed to that require them to hold a particular view of man that is not biblically derived so that they can continue to utilize that particular set of philosophical presuppositions. They will frequently hide that, and then they'll use those philosophical presuppositions. They'll grab a verse here, a verse there, uh, but you're not going to get consistent exegesis uh, out, of, out of these individuals. But there are very intelligent individuals who have made argumentation against presuppositionalism, and that, that's a good thing. It, it helps us to sharpen what it is we're saying. Uh, we're not questioning anyone's uh, in intelligence or things like that. It's the consistency of one's worldview, theology, and apologetic methodology, and how they are related to one another. I have said for decades that one's apologetic methodology has to flow out of one's theology, and I've pointed out a lot of folks, some really big names, that I think you can very fairly say their theology flows from their apologetic methodology, from their philosophical pre, uh, pre-commitments. And of course, there's a bunch of guys out there, a bunch of, uh, bunch of young guys especially, Everything you do is philosophy. As soon as you open your mouth, you're doing philosophy. So philosophy is before everything. Um, So that would mean that before God could speak to Adam, the philosophers had to lay out their systems. No. Yeah. Uh, That's not how it worked. And again, that just shows the difference of where where people are coming from. Um, If God could hold Adam accountable as he did before the first philosopher ever philosophized, uh, then that means God's <laughs> revelation is prior to uh, any of the uh, ordering of men's thoughts uh, or even doing that in a godly way. There is a godly way to be a philosopher, but fundamentally that requires a submission to the ultimate authority of God's revelation first and foremost for anything else. Yes. Let's see here what to add to that. So I think the explanatory power of, uh, of presuppositionalism is bound to reform theology in yeah. terms yeah. of grounding. And someone says, well, see, then that means it's just this isolated thing over here that has to do with reform theology. And what I mean no. is biblical theology. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean is the biblical world Entirety. So when we talk about the, the fallen nature of man, our reasoning capabilities, where humanity is at. Okay, grant this. Every Christian worth their salt is going to say we are born dead in our sins and trespasses and we're born sinners. Okay, that's what we're supposed to be doing. If we're reading Romans chapter 5. Latent Flowers is spinning, oh, okay. is spinning okay. in an office chair somewhere right now, getting wrapped up in his head. Well, I said worth their salt. <laughs> so um, so what, what I mean by that is, is we're talking about biblical theology. We're talking about where we're at. We are fallen. We are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. If you grant that biblical premise, then that means that something is wrong with humanity, men and women. So in the philosophical discussion and debate, we have to grant that biblically speaking, if we actually are grounded in a, in a Christian worldview, we look across the landscape and we have to say that God says something is true about this man that I'm talking to, this woman that I'm talking to, and what he says is that there is no God seeker. What he says is that we are dead in sin and our sins and trespasses, and that we are by nature, children of wrath. And so I, I love how he said that, by the way. He said, um, uh, evidentialism sounds great if we weren't dead in our sins. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that should be the title of a book, right? <laughs> evidentialism would be great if yes. we weren't dead in our sins and trespasses. Yes, yeah. uh, so it is, it is bound to reform theology in terms of its explanatory power. Um, but if you think, if you, and, and here's what I mean. If you move to the differences and distinctions between, say, so the presuppositional or transcendental methodology. Um, we're just talking about a reformed apologetic, ultimately, is how I would say. Um, and you look at someone like, say, William Lane Craig, who is a brilliant man, very intelligent, and has some amazing arguments in terms of explaining historical evidences and all the rest. Look at him in his discussion he had with Lawrence Krauss. I, I find what he said to be 
embarrassing to the Christian faith and the Christian um, uh, the strength of the Christian apologetic when he's talking to Krauss and Krauss says to him, "Are you certain God exists?" And Craig says, "No." Right. You know, I, people can say well, you got to be fair to Craig. He's just talking about from a philosophical perspective. Mm-hmm. Let me listen. If your apologetic methodology puts you to a place where you will say, "I am not certain that God exists." then you're not arguing from the same position philosophically that the apostle is or mm-hmm. Jesus is. Do you think Jesus is walking around and someone says, Jesus, are you sh- are you certain you're the Messiah? And he's like, well, no, you know, I'm fairly certain. Or if you ask Things the are apostle. Things are looking good. Yeah, if you ask the apostle <laughs> Paul, you say, you know, Romans chapter 1, he says that we are without an apologetic, without a right. defense. We right. have no defense before God. That's a very different philosophical perspective than the modern modern, um, they're not all the same, but classical apologist or evidentialist that says, well, we're fairly certain, or it's, you know, it's more like 75-25, like we're mostly there. So I think that the classical or evidential methodology grants far too much ground to the unbeliever that they should not have. One of the things that was so powerful to me early on as I was studying apologetics and learning from Dr. Bonson and listening to Dr. Bonson debate Dr. Sproul on this issue, mm-hmm. one of the things that was was so encouraging to me was to see the strength of the biblical philosophical perspective. And that is to say that you have, from a Christian perspective, a grounding, the preconditions necessary for the discussion of philosophy and reason and logic all the different orders we're trying to get to in terms of putting all this out and classifying it and p- providing a grounding for it. From a Christian perspective, you got it all because you have Jesus, because you have God's Word and His revelation as a starting point. And what's amazing to me, and this, and this I mean this very humbly to my brothers who are classical or evidentialists, very, very, very humbly to them. What's amazing to me is, is that a lot of times as, as people will talk about classical apologetics and history and those sorts of things, um, they'll talk about, like, this was just in the atmosphere. Like, this is how Christians reasoned. And I, I think that there's a reason for that. And that's that the Christian worldview was just assumed by everybody around. Like, like if we're trying to find out the grounding for reason and we're trying to get to um, evidences for the Christian faith that are coherent and meaningful and the text of God's Word and God's existence, and we're all in a room with a bunch of Christians or people that essentially assume the Christian worldview, evidentialism makes sense because Christians need evidence. Mm-hmm. To prove things. Well, here's my point. If you have a Christian yeah. worldview, you demand evidence. Why? Because you love the truth. Because I want to know what's true. Like God even says in his law, we were at this a second ago, don't believe something on the basis of one witness. Mm-hmm. You've got to have multiple lines of evidence. That's built into the Christian worldview. But here's the point. That's how Christians think because they have God's revelation. But here's the question. Why is the unbeliever asking for that? Right. Like, from a Christian perspective and our philosophy, all of this makes sense. But that's because you have God's Word as, as the starting point. Right. So what, when I want to approach the issue of the defense of the existence of God, I don't want to grant any ground to the atheist that he's not supposed to have. Right. Like, I know what he says. I've read their books. I listen to hours of their lectures. And what I say is they talk to me is like, look, if I really want to be honest and accept your position, like I've really thought about this. I've really tried to put myself in the mind of the atheist. How was he thinking day to day when he faces suffering and trials and difficulties? All of it's meaningless. There's no meaning to it all. When he sees something on the news of some tragedy, there's no meaning to that. Because here's the thing. I think if I was an atheist, I would be a really good atheist. And I would be nasty because I would believe it all and try to be consistent with it. I would try to say there is no meaning, there is no purpose, there is no good, there is no evil. All of this is just stuff happening. My point is, is Christians have the strength of God's revelation that grants to us reason, logic, ethics, science, all the rest. Why are we going to grant that to the unbeliever when they're at war with God and shouldn't have it to begin with? Right. Right. Hey, you got uh, you got your two questions and got a lot of commentary too, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you. I just I, I really started to feel convicted about being an evidentialist because I remember I was watching one of your reviews of Michael Acona, and you were talking about like this incrementalism, right? And apologetics, and I was like, he is absolutely right. Like I have been taught before. I repented. I would talk with people and I would tell them, "No, it's art. That bothers you. Jesus rose from the dead." <laughs> right, and then I started coming into Reformed theology, and I was like, "Goodness gracious, that was not." Ju-. I remember Doctor White said, 
it will be odd for you to trust Jesus for salvation, but you don't trust his view of Scripture. And I don't see Jesus ever arguing with somebody and saying, the Old Testament bothers you, but I'm about to rise from the dead. That's old. Like, Jesus, Jesus never does that. And I was like, I have to repent, Lord. I'm sorry. You never had that view of the Word. Oh, man. Devante, thank you very, very much for your call today. I hope that was useful. What is it? Was it, Rich? Was oh, I just wanted to key on, he, he brought up Mike Lacona, and what Jeff was just saying made me think exactly of th- that show that you did last week where this this whole 80 20 thing if you look i think he's up to 85 let's give him let's okay, give him, 85. okay 85 right, so. the point would be that if you look at how the writers of the new testament present their case it is not with any skepticism it is 100 percent faith they believe what they're writing as they present it with 100 percent conviction we have I guess maybe you could look at Peter being having to be confronted by Paul, but the only quote unquote doubter we have presented in the entire New Testament is a guy named Thomas. Yeah, and he 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 came around. He, he, <laughs> he's okay. came around. Hey, Devonte, thanks for your co- phone call. We're gonna get to the other guys real quick here, uh, and we'll try to be a little faster in our responses. Let's talk to uh, Joshua. Hi, Joshua. Hi, Dr. White. Hey, Mr. Jeff. How are you guys doing? Hey. Great. Uh, I, I had a really quick question. I used to be a Christian camp counselor, and I still try to keep up with some of the guys I used to teach. Uh, I've seen one guy lately who's I've been posting a lot of stuff on his social media about Islam, a lot of links to the Dean Show. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, what would be your first, what would be the best way to sort of reach out to him? What would be your starting uh, apologetic? Because as much as I which he would. I don't think he's going to watch all your debates. You know, uh, I recommend them. Well, if he's if he's <laughs> if he's willing to watch the Dean show, he should be willing to watch my stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, I've I've done a number of programs over the years uh, responding to people on the Dean show. So if you look up D E E N in the search engine the search box at the bottom of our current page, which will not be at the bottom of our current page in its future uh, iteration. Um, you'll pull up a number of, of uh, references to where I've responded to people on the program. But, you know, that's <clears throat> what the, the best way to go there. I mean, if this is an individual who has any kind of background whatsoever, is you, you need to um, really challenge them to think through what they, what they think they have been taught uh, so that they can see that the assertions of Islam uh, very often are based upon a misunderstanding of what we've been taught. I mean, I, I haven't watched every edition of the Dean Show, but I've watched enough of them to know that the uh, level of inaccuracy of representation of Christian belief is extremely high. And someone has to be challenged to say, why would that be? Why, why can't you actually respond uh, to real Christianity? Uh, why do you have to deal with something else? Now, Part of the reason for that is the author of the Quran didn't know real Christianity, so they come by it honestly. Um, but then there are other people uh, on that program that, as quote unquote former Christians, just simply uh, massacre what it is they're presenting. So make sure he has, um, you know, challenge him to to read meaningful material on both sides because I honestly believe if you compare. Uh, the Forgotten Trinity uh, to the best that the Dean Show has to offer on that subject. There's not going to be much of a much of a, um, a competition there. And um, you know, if he's if he's not if he's willing to listen to the Dean Show but not willing to listen to meaningful debates done in mosques, then he's already made up his mind, and there's not much you can do about that. Um, but you know, I direct him to the the debates that are done in mosques with Muslims. That's about as fair as you're going to get. And if Christianity can stand in that mosque and and uh, go toe-to-toe, then he has to ask himself the question, why don't I see this happening on the Dean Show? Why does Dean Show only give one side of this and never, ever, ever, ever the other side at all? Though I'd be more than happy to provide it. Uh, why, why is that? So those are just some of the basic things. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, like I said, I only have the one question to so let you go. Okay. Although, if you have any uh, quick words of uh, advice for a first-year Greek student, I'd take those two. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's best if you're not taking uh, other languages at the same time. 
if you've already started, this next piece is irrelevant, but if you haven't, then learning English before learning Greek really helps. Uh, most of the students that I had that struggled in first year Greek were struggling with Greek, uh, I'm sorry, were struggling with grammatical concepts, not with Greek, because they didn't know their own language well enough. Uh, utilize the uh, resources that are available. There are lots of resources available on your phone today for keeping up with the vocabulary. If you do not keep up with the vocabulary, the rest will turn into mud in your head. Um, if you keep up with the vocabulary, then you have more brain power to focus upon the specific concepts that you're picking up as you're being, as you're being taught it. And then uh, buy yourself a Greek New Testament, and when you go to church, when they're reading from the New Testament, try to, try to follow along. Expose yourself to the language. Um, don't, let, don't let a day go by where you're not exposing yourself to it. It'll help it to seep in over time. Okay? Thank you, Dr. White. All right. All right. God bless. Bye-bye. God bless. All right. And let's get to John. Hi, John. Hey, Dr. White. Brother Jeff. Hello. Very happy to be on the phone with you guys. Good to be with you. Um, I just, uh, I'm standing by a truck going by. All right, he's gone. Uh, <laughs> my mom, who I do not live with, but she calls me just about every night to throw punches at me, uh, is a very hardcore charismatic. We were raised in an Assemblies of God church. Uh, and so I have to deal with that just about nightly, um, her calls. Okay. Uh, the latest one, I was fine when she was attacking Steven Anderson and whatever. I'd say, yeah, he's crazy. I don't know. I don't know any of that yet. But last night she called me and asked about, uh, she said it was Apologia Church. Uh oh. That's what she called it. And as soon as she called it a church, I realized, um, who she had found. Now, do you, do you uh, but, think? Do you think? Do you think maybe you've called the right place uh, right now? I, yeah, 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 definitely, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just simply saying you have half the eldership of Apologia Church. That's uh, right. On we the can phone answer, with we you can right answer now, all so the questions. I think, think we're good. Uh, we can, we can get Luke is, and Zach on the phone if we need to make right. it, make it the whole group. So oh, yeah, we're we're good. All right, I already know what they'll say okay. though. <laughs> Good, good. You you already have their uh, their knowledge imparted to you, so you can answer for them. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm fine with dealing with her, and, and actually the rest of my close family are the same. Uh, a while back, we we hold a service here Sunday where we meet. Uh, I'm forced to attend and listen. Uh, they asked me to lead a Wednesday night service here. Uh, I'm in no shape to do that, but I did it anyway. I preached on the Trinity which I know none of them understand mm. because of their upbringing. They've never really had to deal with that. Uh, and somewhere along there, I gave away, somehow, uh, my Reformed theology. Mm. I don't know where they caught on to it, at what point in the sermon I gave it away, but I did. <laughs> and so ever since then, I've been dealing with phone calls. Um, last night, she called me. Uh, she listened to uh, Brother Jeff's uh, a recent sermon. But I, Every sermon that you post about, about the tribulation, you cover pretty much the same ground, uh, and you make perfect sense to me uh, every time, uh, mainly Matthew 24. I love reading that, as in the days of Noah. Uh, it's clearly... <laughs> I, I won't get into it, but it's amazing how they've, how they've changed that to be good, uh, if you know what I'm talking about. Right, like, no, exactly, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's amazing to me that they've changed that to be taken away as a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, she brought up 1 Corinthians 13.10. Uh, I am a cessationist myself. Uh, she knows that. That was probably the biggest blow to her because she is holding on to traditions that were ingrained in us, in her as a child and in me as a child, from our grandparents my grandparents. Um, but uh, she brought up 1 Corinthians 13.10. Obviously, uh, that with, uh, when that is, which is perfect comes... I don't know about heart in every translation, but right. essentially she brings that up to say uh, that I'm wrong. <laughs> it's basically a throw, a shouting match uh, that, that I'm wrong about everything that, that I've said recently. I, I try not to talk about it much with her, but basically uh, I've tried to explain what biblical apostleship is, what right. how we don't have them today, how it's impossible, how 
yeah, prophecy, what that means, how that can uh, that doesn't happen today. And she loves Perry Stone, and she loves Jonathan Kahn. And when I talk about this, I'm basically crapping on her idols. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, uh, but it's hard. But yeah, what? Well, uh, just just a couple things. Well, 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 John, um, so the the main thing she didn't like about apologia was the eschatology and Jeff's preaching from Matthew 24. No. Or was there something more? She watched maybe, maybe 10 minutes of a sermon he put up uh, either yesterday or the okay, day that's, before. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's not even the introduction for Jeff. <laughs> I, I know, I know. But it, now, but, no, I, I'm into you, point two by then, but, but no, not, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, no, no she, I'm not saying she watched the first 10 minutes. I mean, she watched overall... <laughs> Maybe ten. She watched mm-hmm. enough to hear him call, to hear him say, "Doctor White." So then she knew Doctor White. She called me last <laughs> night. I've mentioned your name, <laughs> uh, so she called me last night. And said, Is this the Doctor White that you're listening to? <laughs> so, the one that he was so, talking uh, about. They're all connected. It's a conspiracy. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. No. It's a huge conspiracy. This guy's connected to apologia, and this is where you're getting all your crap from. And, <laughs> but, uh, but that specific. I mean, I've talked about you guys with with other people in the family. Uh, my uncle is a little bit more open minded. That I'm trying uh, to reach him, and, and when I say I'm trying to reach him, it feels uh, arrogant to me to yeah. say that. But I feel like I'm right, and they're wrong, and I don't yeah. really know how else to. I understand. To put that, but, well, look, look, John. Um, family family situations uh, can be. It, it, it this whole area is highly emotional, and then when you put it into the context of family, and when you put it into the context of you were once here and now you're over there, there is automatically a self defense mechanism that kicks in because what the person's hearing you saying is they are wrong, you are right, and so they bring up all the family stuff and everything else in it. It can be extremely difficult. Um, it, it can be so complicated that in many times I've seen people outside the family be able to get much more uh, distance as far as being able to get somewhere than interfamilial conversations, unfortunately. But it, in light of that, then I would, um, my suggestion would always be um, that. Let's use, let's use, I'm not sure which sermon it was, but um, just thinking about Sunday's sermon with, with Jeff, he got to the end of the, of the sermon, and he's like, okay, so what does this all mean? He, was, he had been just talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse and so on and so forth. Do we all just take this information and leave here and go, oh, that's cool, uh, you know, now I can... I can uh, throw this at some Tim LaHaye fan or something like that. Um, no, uh, he's talking about God's promises, and he's talking about God's faithfulness. And, and one of the main arguments through this whole sermon series, sorry to be summarizing this for you, oh, brother, but that's I'm good. sitting out there listening. I'm, I'm making sure it's, uh, okay, good. It's, yeah. I, uh, I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing all right. It's working. It's okay. working. Yeah, he's listening. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was sleeping during all this. Oh, no, he's actually listening. Hey, by the way, it's not fair that I have to he preach sermons to Dr. White at church, like uh, it, it's 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 weird. Like you understand, you understand what kind of pressure that is to have to teach for Dr. <laughs> and I White. I sit down front so you can see yeah. me very clearly. Like you're putting together sermons and you're like, okay, and this and teach the church, and this person knows nothing about the Bible or eschatology. Okay, but Dr. White's there, so. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff you wanna, is handling it really you well. You want to shine, but you don't want to go over anybody's head. That's right. That's right. So the point, the point is, he made the, the, one of the points he's made throughout the the series he's been doing in Matthew chapter twenty four. This is important stuff because this demonstrates that Jesus was a true prophet. He yeah. was not a false prophet. That the arguments that have been constantly used that Jesus got it wrong, just simply miss the historical reality, and so go toward the end of the sermon, and maybe the next time she calls, what you can do is you can say, okay, Mom, I'm, I'm sorry you don't like what he said there, 
but did you did you hear what he said at the end? Could we could we agree that it's important that we that we be really focused on the fact that that Jesus was a true prophet and that things happened that he said were going to happen? Isn't it good that, that we can emphasize that that God's promises are true and that he's going to be faithful to accomplish the things that he's said that he's going to accomplish? In other words, what I'm saying is not not I'm not just simply saying just avoid the conflict. It just sounds like it's conflict for the sake of conflict, which doesn't really it get is. you anywhere. Oh, it is. It and is. So, she doesn't understand the role of the miracles. She doesn't understand the role of the prophecy, the, the reason he said it. She assumes it was all for us. Right, I all understand. All the miracles are for us. I understand. I, I get it, and your task is going to be to find some way, respectfully, because you're to honor your father and your mother, gracefully because if you're representing a message of grace then you can't become ungracious in the presentation of that message to find some way of turning her toward the positive truths without necessarily getting all all bogged down in all the in all the negative stuff i i know that is not always possible but it's got to be your goal uh that that's what you got to be working toward and that's it's, that, it's as if she she's arguing for the sake of her tradition. For what? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, what but we see, were raised on. That's where it's but at. see, but see, let me, let, John, let me just, let me just tell you a story. Uh, and I've this is the one one story that I remember. But I've had somebody else tell me that I did almost the exact same thing to them. But there have been a number of times in my life when when someone knew they were going to be meeting with me. And they decided they wanted to have a little debate with me about some element of theology. And when we got together, I wouldn't debate them. And I sort of blew them off. And I basically said, well, you know, if you want to go that direction, but just remember, and I just gave them something positive. And they walked away really disappointed because they're all geared up for this big debate, and they're all deflated. And then they start thinking about what I said, and eventually they're like, "Oh man, he was right." Oh, and and it ended up and in both instances, it ended up changing the entire paradigm of their theology. And it wasn't because I blasted them in a debate; it was actually because I sort of blew them off, and then in the process, gave them one thing that they didn't expect that they were going to get. So what I'm saying is don't give up on the possibility that you might have that one conversation where something that you don't expect was really important ends up being the one thing that gets her thinking. You know, but if, if, if you know, the best thing I can say is be prayerful. Be prayerful in <clears throat> when you expect the phone call to come. Always be respectful. She's your mom. And... You know, if it gets to the point where it's starting to really strain your relationship, then just say, let's let's not discuss this uh, and pray well, that, that God will bring somebody else into your life. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I think that, and this is one thing I always say to people pastorally at Apologia as this issue comes up quite often, like I'm having a conversation with my boss or my mom, my sister, is that we need to consider different contexts as we're preaching the gospel and defending the faith. So there's a difference between how I'm going to handle a person who I meet in the line at Starbucks and sees that I'm carrying a Bible. They're asking questions. We have a conversation. I say, hey, I'll meet you here tomorrow. We have a conversation again tomorrow. I have moments ahead of me with this person, and it, it, this isn't in front of an abortion clinic. Right. So if I'm standing in front of the abortion clinic, and I know that I have 15 seconds from door to door, mm-hmm. from when the mom comes out of the door to when she goes in to kill her child, I am handling that very, very differently mm-hmm. because I have 15 seconds to save this child's life. Mm-hmm. I've got to tell her, don't murder your child. This is Christ. He'll he'll forgive you. Turn to him and live, and will help you. Like 15 seconds, and I'm pleading for the life of a child, and I I will call it murder. I mean, I'm not you know I'm, I'm cautious about how I do that at Starbucks, right? right. But I'm I'm gonna be yeah. like yeah, for, you don't want your latte poison. For example, um, <laughs> uh, Gary Demar and I we, we filmed something that's going to go up in Apologia Studio soon. Last week we filmed at uh, Benihana. We like took a whole table up. We filmed this conversation at Benihana. They're you know making food on the table and we're having a conversation. Um, I I waited until listen. I, this is the truth. I waited until our chef left the table before right. I started talking about abortion. Yeah, knives. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's 
so says, sweet of you. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, it's just context. And when I have a conversation with a family member, I need to realize, look, I've got Thanksgiving and Christmas and birthdays yeah, and marriages yeah, with yeah. this person. Mm-hmm. I've got maybe some time. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to compromise. Right. It means I'm going to be wise about how I actually present this stuff and recognize this is a family relationship. This person's not going anywhere. I have to see them again. I can have more time. In I God's providence, I mean. In God's providence. You know, things can change. I, I, may not, I may not need to blitz this person with everything all at once and then completely divide the relationship and never get another opportunity again. And we need to be wise about how I do that. And so just be careful. And I would say also, I would just drop little seeds and remember this crucial, crucial thing. How hard was it for me to come out of this partially Arminian uh, perspective yeah, right. to reform uh, theology? Right. It took some work. Yeah. Yeah. And it took some yeah. argument and some sleepless nights and some, some moments of sweat and tears. And it was pa- I remember the moment I walked out of my bedroom to tell Candy that I'm, 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 I'm definitely a Calvinist, was after a long, long time of study and work, and I remember bursting out of the room after reading Bettner's Predestination and the list there, and I was like, <laughs> that's it! I'm a Calvinist! And, and she's like, what? I'm like, I, 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 I guess I always have been. I was just confused. I'm, I'm definitely a Calvinist. She's like, oh! Like, you know, wow! And uh, the same thing for me with the issue of eschatology. It took work. So I need to make sure that every person is leaving a nasty comment at Apologia Studios, <laughs> I'm always aware that this person may come back a year from now or two years oh, yes. from now oh, and yes. say, you know what? Because yeah. I've had it happen so many times yeah. now I've lost yeah. count. Yeah. Jeff, I hated you. I was mm-hmm. so angry with you. Mm-hmm. And then it was that one verse <laughs> that changed my mind. And so I'm just always ready for that. And I'm always aware that it may take this person some time. I've got to be patient and let God do his work with his truth. I can't tell you how many times someone has come up to me, uh, people now in ministry in Reformed churches, and they said it was the George Bryson debate on the Bible Answer Man. They said, I was driving along. I was screaming at the radio. I hated you. I couldn't believe what you were saying. And then I had to keep reading. And every time I'd read my Bible, I'd see it there. And, and eventually, and, and it, you know, it just took, it took sometimes years. This but, bald devil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. I'm sure there was some... Real nice things along the line, yeah. So you, you, yeah. Have, you have a critical look about you. A critical you, um, look. I don't know what it is. Oh, wow. I li- I'm liking his beard though. Look at that good beard critical, coming in around. Critical look at this. look. Hmm. hmm. It's. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Critical. I don't know. Uh, critical. Uh, crisp. Sharp. Crisp. Uh, but um. I don't um. Know. Piercing. Piercing. Let me ask you. Piercing. Where Where do you draw the line? <laughs> Uh, between, uh, like, I'm sitting here listening to, to her talk to other people in the family. I know what she's saying is not biblical. I know I can go to Scripture. Yeah, but... And, and I can look at, am I lying? Am I supposed to say something? Or is it okay, after a year and a half of this, to say she's going to have to come to it on her own? Or, or is that arrogant of me to say? I don't even know where to go from that everybody point. everybody has to make that decision uh, prayerfully always with great patience and grace but there there has to come a time there has to come a time where you're, you say I've I've said everything that, that can be said if the Lord's going to do something else here he's going to have to bring somebody else to do it um, I've I, I can think of numerous situations in my own life where I was far more patient with someone believe it or not I was far more patient with someone than another Christian would have been with that same person. And then knowing that person, I know there are people that they were so much more uh, patient with somebody than I would have been. So that's why there's a body. Um, you've just, you've just got to be transparent before the Lord. It's your mom. Always be there for her. Always love her. It doesn't mean you always have to debate her on theology, you know, even if she yeah. goes you to do it. So as long as she knows that you're where you stand and that you're you're ready when she's ready but you don't have to you don't have to let it absolutely destroy your your situation either so okay man i appreciate it look look real quick uh (laughs) jeff um i I love your work uh luke joy i love summer i love sheologians i love all of that uh the work you guys are doing and dr white i can't imagine traveling that much but um (laughs) it's a sacrifice that i respect both Thank of you. you. So I just wanted Thank to say that. 
I really appreciate very the encouragement much. very much. All right. Thanks, John. Hey, Thank you. Thank you. All right. God bless. If John listens to this later on, I, I would like to add one thing to this, and that is, John, I, I would encourage you to actually play this segment for her. Oh. I, okay. I would I would encourage you to do that and see what kind of impact that has on her because I think it has value. Oh, okay. All right, thanks, John. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. All you right. guys have a good one. All right, you thanks. Too. God bless. Well, Jeff, I know that you have a uh, appointment that you need to, uh, counseling. to get to. you got counseling to do. Yep. And uh, so I figured I, I was going to try to shoot for 315. We did. So we got it. We're, I'm we're, good. We're, 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 doing, we're doing good. Um Thank you so much. Um, I think folks enjoyed getting the opportunity to uh, to talk to both of us at the same time. Yes. Um, and you're right. I, I I've even contacted you a couple times from uh, the other side of the earth uh, to point out somebody's. Well, again tonight, somebody came up to me and said, "Hey, I found out about you from watching Jeff Durbin stuff." And, and then it goes. And then I found out about Jeff Durbin by watching your stuff. And uh, another person says and. Uh, it just we are we need to keep taking advantage of these opportunities while we have yeah. them to be certain. But that's right. It's uh, it's great to have the opportunity of answering these types of questions and doing it from it. it, it what's the what's the section from the psalm uh, that talks about uh, how how blessed it is when brethren dwell in unity? Unity. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, so you know we talk about who's going to be filling the pulpit at Apologia. We don't we don't have to worry about who's going to be preaching what. Because uh, we know that we're going to be preaching the same gospel That's and right. going the same direction. So That's right. um, you're up uh, next Sunday. That's right. And, and then, then I'm up the Sunday after that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I'll be continuing the uh, Lord's Supper series. That's we're right. What are we be, on now, four? Uh, this will be the fourth one, and we're going to go into the confession this time. Okay. So I, I, I can only imagine two more. Mm-hmm. So I think it'll be about six uh, on the supper. So we're going to go into... The London Baptist Confession of Faith on the Lord's Supper. I'll try to get it done in, in two sessions. I think it's be really, really helpful for people. Yeah, I, I, six parts. It would be nice to have that available as a playlist or something like that someplace yep. Uh, yep. to to deal with the subject, of the Lord's Supper, because I think that's extremely important. And interestingly enough, the last time that I ministered down in uh, South Africa at Antioch Bible Church, they reminded me of this. I had remembered it that we're going that uh, I preached to them about. The Lord's Supper, and they found that extremely useful, very helpful to do that. Oh yeah. And uh, what's this I, here? I just saw it sitting here. Did yes. you put it here for a reason? No, it, no, it's, it, no, it just happened to be in it's, here. Okay. But it's, so it's apology is. Uh, uh, so I'll say two two things. I just saw it there reminded me. One is that ReformCon is happening October twenty fourth right. and twenty sixth here in Phoenix. ReformCon.org is where you can get tickets. So it's uh, I'm very excited about it. The last day is going to be an end abortion now portion, okay. um, and uh, churches coming from across the country. But we also are premiering Babies and Murdered here too oh. at the conference. Oh. So Dr. White is speaking. Uh, Joe Boot is coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a bunch of guys, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, Sh- Summer's going to be here. Yep. We're going to do Sheologians uh, live, Apologia Radio. Um, just, just, just to have fun. Just everyone gets together. Let's and hope the internet works well. That's. I, but we're <laughs> we're going to work really hard on that. Uh, next thing is is because we're going to be in Salt Lake City. I know there's lots of Christians in Salt Lake City and around in Utah that are really going to. Um, come say hi. Last time it happened, we mm-hmm. barely announced it. We had a ton of people show up just to mm-hmm. say that God's been using the ministries, both yours and mine, in their lives. And so a lot of people are showing up. A lot of people want to do evangelism. Um, out there, I just want to tell you that um, our tract is available um, at ApologiaStudios.com. We just got a new order in there selling out constantly. Mm-hmm. Gospel for Mormons. Um, and so we just got a new order in. So ApologiaStudios.com if you want to get the Gospel for Mormons tract that we're going to be handing out. And pretty soon, and I grab one of the original Grace Plus Works tracks for me, so I can get that editing done. Uh, we have, uh, it's the Grace Plus Works track, isn't it? Um, a Million Tracks is doing it, right? Yeah. So, the Grace Plus Works is dead, being meaningless tracks, being done by one million tracks. Is that going to be ready by next month? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll, 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 bring I'll, try, I'll try to bring tracks, yeah. but, but they're going to be putting it out, and when they put it out, Everybody ends up getting it. Yeah, They're far, far better. If you've got tracks, yeah. Rich, send them with us. We're gonna have a team driving up. We'll have tracks to hand out. But so I just, I just saw this sitting here, and so apology no, studio over there, and I just didn't move it. So. Yeah. So yeah. this, uh, the gods really use this tract. Um, I'm encouraged by it. So yeah, just want to make sure I announce that. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for listening to the program today. Lord willing, we'll be back with you probably Tuesday of next week. Till then, God bless. <laughs>